make this in as if okay i'll do <laughs> hello everyone thanks for having me i do want to make this as interactive as possible so i'm going to try to go kind of quick so then we can have a rich dialogue uh, but i am becky kakula i am as megan said the senior director of the disability quality index at disability in and that means that I run a benchmarking tool that companies utilize to advance disability inclusion within their organizations. I also do public speaking in schools, especially when it comes to a child with a disability transitioning from elementary to middle school or middle to high school, really trying to be that resource, allow the teachers and the students to ask me the hard questions rather than that student who's already worried about standing out more than uh, they do. So I'm gonna give a little bit of my journey. I am a person with a physical disability that is dwarfism. I have also recently identified as someone who is managing grief through the loss of my infant son. So that's another part to my identity. So I am a mother who's experienced loss and also a person with dwarfism, physical disability. I really didn't think that mental health affected me as much as it did more recently. Um, it's very possible for people with physical disabilities to experience mental health earlier in life because society is constantly reminding us that we're different. But uh, I think Patty can probably speak to this. Uh, having met my family and parents, they're, they've always been very good from the beginning to hype me up and give me the support I need, but also allow me to understand that the outside world may not always be kind. And um, I feel that I have up until this past year, I had this shield where it was like, I'm invincible. Nobody can touch my feelings, but some things don't make sense. But I will go back a little bit in my story. I am the only person with dwarfism in my family. My parents are average height. My dad's actually 6'4". People are confused as to how we could be related, but 80% of people with dwarfism are born into families where there's no history of dwarfism. So when I was first born back in 1984, I will age myself, uh, I <laughs> was born at Newton Wellesley Hospital, and there was only one person who was in the delivery room where I was born who had seen a person with dwarfism be born in that in, in an environment like that. She had to let my parents know that she thinks that I have dwarfism, but didn't have all the answers. There weren't enough resources in that hospital. So I did not end up going to the NICU, but I did have trouble breathing through the first night of my life. But I was in the maternity unit with my mother. And fortunately, I, I, I was alive and alive now to, to tell about it. And after about three or four days, when my mom was discharged from the hospital with me, I would, it was recommended that we go to another hospital to meet with a genetic counselor. And when my parents checked in at that hospital, they were told that they need to follow the signs that say birth defects down the hallway to the elevator that says birth defects floor. And then there'd be another sign that says birth defects and the genetic counselor would be waiting for them. My parents don't remember anything that was said in that meeting. <laughs> the way that the genetic counselor was branding themselves was not okay. So after they left that meeting, they ended up writing a letter and the signs were immediately changed because you do not tell a parent that their child has birth defects. Even if there's something different going on, they want more answers than the assumption that their child's going to amount to nothing. So that was just the beginning of my parents advocating on my behalf until I was able to advocate for myself. It took them about six months to find a specialist for dwarfism in the Baltimore area. So I grew up in the Boston area. There are a lot of great medical resources in the Boston area, but there weren't the right resources at that point in time. My parents were invited to sign up for a sleep study. It's very common for people with dwarfism to have sleep apnea. Uh, where just because everything is more narrow in our facial structure, um, including even our e airways for ear tubes in and out, very common. So there was a doctor who specializes in dwarfism, Dr. Stephen Kopitz, and he was taking 
signups for a sleep study. And if we signed up for the sleep study, then we would be able to get an appointment with him because he was already booked up for years to come. My parents ended up driving me down to Baltimore to do the sleep study. They got to his office and he had a waiting room full of people. And because he had a waiting room full of people, they didn't know when it was going to be their turn. But when he was in between patients, he looked in the waiting room and saw the ghostly white look on my parents' faces and knew that he needed to pull them in and answer some questions. So he spent two hours with my parents, even though there was a waiting room full of people, to answer all of their questions. He didn't have a magic wand to say that everything was going to be perfect, but he gave them enough confidence to be supportive and navigate whatever the future may hold. So then things were starting to look up and I ended up going down to Baltimore and we, it would be okay if we would wait eight hours for appointments. So at about, I think I had, I had a, a back brace to help with alignment. And then when I was three years old, I ended up having leg surgery because I was bow legged. And then when I was 13, I had bone put back in my legs since I was considered almost done growing just to help with the alignment. And then when I was 15, I unfortunately lost my ability to walk. I was active in sailing, soccer, skiing, swimming, so very active in a lot of the activities that my peers were part of. And I thought that maybe it was just that my wetsuit was on too tight, but it was the start of spinal cord compression. So right now I'm sitting up and if we were all in a room together, it would look like we were a similar height. I just have shorter arms and legs. So it, even though my torso looks like it's average height, all of my organs are more compact. So my spinal column was pinching up against my spinal cord and I couldn't even walk a few feet without falling. So we ended up actually talking to the doctor in Baltimore. He was an orthopedic doctor and was honest about it, that he was also getting older and he was worried about his hand shaking in order to perform a successful surgery. So he referred us to uh, Dr. Ben Carson. I know he's been involved in politics, but he is someone who did save my life. So we went to his office in Baltimore. So this, the compression started happening around the August timeframe. So we had an appointment in September and he was booked up for about six months and didn't think he'd be able to get me in until the next year. But fortunately, when we got home from the appointment, we got a phone call and it was the end of October that I was able to have this surgery. One of my biggest fears for that surgery was missing school. I wasn't as fearful of like being in the hospital because I'd been in the hospital for different surgeries. I was nervous about falling behind in school. I felt confident that I was in a good place academically. I was an honor student. I just thought that I had the right momentum, but then a setback really scared me, but I knew it was important because there could be more setbacks if I didn't address it. So I ended up missing 29 days of school. I went from honors classes to college preparatory classes once I returned back to school, but it was really important for me to stay in the same grade, even though I could have taken the whole year off to recover. I wanted to make sure that I stayed with my grade. One of the pieces of advice the doctor gave my parents back in the day was try to keep her in the same school system, because if you keep her in the same school system, she'll know the same people and it'll help prevent potential bullying. But I think it has to even be more narrow than that. It's like keep her with the same grade of people who grow up with her and get, gain an understanding to be respectful and there will be people grades below and grades above who may know her, but not everyone. And they won't be as invested because they're not necessarily in my classes. And I did have a friend who was in my class from preschool to seventh grade. My parents kind of facilitated that on the back end with her parents, but it was the best thing that could have ever happened because I had someone who could look out for me up until that age to really just look out for anyone who may be making fun of me or making comments. I truly don't feel that I was bullied. But I think the challenges in social isolation started happening after my surgery. People were super supportive during my surgery and even as I was recovering. But then 
all my girlfriends got to the age where they started dating and and it didn't make sense for me to be around because they didn't think that that was something that I was interested in or there's that general assumption that little people would date other little people and at that point in my life I was in denial because I hadn't really gotten involved in the little people organization that I'm heavily involved in now I just was fine being the only person with the difference within my group of friends so junior year was really challenging because that was a, a sophomore year was when I had the surgery and then I was recovered and then just trying to navigate how to be social and be part of groups that weren't really inviting. But then senior year came about, everyone was excited to get ready for college. And there was a little bit more of people coming together. And I had a little bit of resentment, but I, in a lot of the work that I do, I try to encourage people not to hold grudges and I try very hard not to, <laughs> uh, but really the goal is to get to know me as a learning experience and learn how to do better. So then fast forward to college, I ended up applying to nine schools. I chose Providence College in Rhode Island because when I was on tour there, there was another person with dwarfism who was in the cafeteria. So she would have been a year above me. And I thought at least this environment has been exposed to one other person with dwarfism. So for another kind of fact for con context is that there are only about 60,000 people with dwarfism in the United States and a few hundred thousand in the world. So most people in everyday life do not come across a person with dwarfism and their perceptions come from the media because that's all that there is when it comes to dwarfism perceptions. So I was excited that there was someone else like me. I didn't feel a need to put in my roommate match assignment information that I was a person with dwarfism because I didn't think that it mattered. So I had two roommates that I was assigned to freshman year and one roommate actually ended up getting really scared when she found out that I had dwarfism. We talked on the phone, got along really well, but we got to school. I actually arrived at school three days earlier than everyone else because I participated in this urban action program. It was like Habitat for Humanity, working on a farm with 150 other incoming freshmen, just a way to get to know people early. So I'd already moved into the dorm and she pushed all of my stuff to the side of the room once she moved in and was shocked and surprised and scared. And it was about six months of learning how to be independent and go to school and also proving that I wasn't going to jump out and scare this person. So I almost got to the point where I moved out into another dorm, but there just weren't other opportunities. But by my, the end of my freshman year, I became very close with someone who continues to be my best friend. She was actually involved in that urban action program and we were roommates for the rest of college. But it was challenging trying to prove to someone that I could be independent and not rely on them and I don't know what they're scared of while also trying to get good grades and stay in college. We had to take four years of Western civilization. It's a requirement for those people who go to Providence College and it was challenging, uh, but I wouldn't trade going to college for anything in the world because I feel like it was it's a great time to be able to get to know yourself and your habits and what you want to do. So towards the second half of school, I was able to focus more on the marketing major that I had and the business classes. And I did a lot of different internships. I was really hoping to get a great internship from my junior to senior year because I knew it was going to be very important. I had seen an article in the Boston Business Journal that was the top 100 ad agencies in the Boston area. I sent my resume to all of them just to see what happened. And the one company that responded to me was Allied Advertising. They're now called Allied Integrated Marketing. And they are the intermediary between movie companies and the general public. So they'll fill advanced screenings. At that time, a popular movie was Happy Feet. So you try to find families in the Boston area to go see an advanced screening of Happy Feet. And then someone like me, an intern, would go and watch the movie with these people and take notes on what people reacted to. So then we could send those notes to the studios to make any potential changes before the wide release. And then the goal is also to have all these families who go to a free movie refer 
friends to go pay for a ticket once it comes out. And I did that and thought, man, this entertainment industry has a lot of influence on how society views a lot of things, basically all aspects of life. How can I learn more about this industry that has so much influence because it ultimately influences people like me and how we're perceived in society? And I knew that I couldn't solve it all right there. And I knew that I had to prove myself as a hard worker before anyone would listen to me. But I became more interested in pursuing a career behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. I ended up working at the NBC affiliate in Providence as an intern during the fall of my senior year, promotions and publicity. There was also an opportunity to work with a casting company who was filming the movie Underdog that Peter Dinklage was in, in the Providence area that back in the summer of 2006. So I was asked to actually be a stand-in for Peter Dinklage. So a stand-in is when they're setting up the movie set and the actor really doesn't have to act until everything is set up. So they bring in people who look similar or are a similar height to the actor so they can set up all the lighting and then the actor can come act. And it's also really helpful for children actors because they are required to have a certain amount of schooling. So that gives them time to take their classes while someone else is on set before they actually have to act. Unfortunately, it seemed like an awesome opportunity. It was gonna pay well for the summer but it conflicted with my last two weeks of school and I couldn't say no to finishing school. I would have very frustrated parents. Uh, so I had already made the connection with the casting director and I said, you know what, even though this opportunity is not gonna work, how can I help out with the casting throughout the summer just so I can learn about the business? That I was given the opportunity to work for free as an intern and sometimes I would call up to 300 extras a day and people, because it's a Providence area and it's not really known for filming movies, people were willing to cancel life-threatening doctor's appointments just to be on set. And I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? But my job was just to try to get 300 people to show up for a crowd scene. And I did that throughout the summer. And while I was in college, I did finally decide to get involved in this organization, Little People of America. There was a conference happening in Danvers, Mass., at the it's summer after my freshman year in college. And I thought, you know what, let me go check it out. I was a little hesitant, but then the longer I stayed involved, I started to get to know a lot of people who happen to live in Southern California. And that was another driving force for me to think, you know what, maybe I'll try to move to California. So one of my friends that I had met at those conventions that happen every summer, was an actor and he told me that I could work for his talent manager, another way to learn about the industry. So my parents said, you need a job and a place to live and we'll support you moving out to California. So I found a place to live and a couple who I had met through the organization allowed me to stay on their couch for as long as I needed to. And then I had the job set up and my parents had to agree to take a flight out to LA and help get me settled. Well, halfway through the week while they were helping me get settled, the job fell through, but I was already out there. All my stuff was there. They told me that if I treated every day like a job, looking for a job, then they would support me. So that's what I did. I reached out to the Providence Alumni Network, even though Providence is a small school in Rhode Island, there happened to be a lot of people out in the Los Angeles area pursuing careers in the industry. And one guy happened to be an actor and he invited me to work for his talent manager. Again, I went from a paid opportunity to a non-paid opportunity, but it was a way to learn. And I knew that even though I was gonna help this talent manager out, I needed to still be looking for jobs. So I sent out 1000 resumes when I'm 100 interviews over the course of four months. So this was August, 2006 to January, 2007. And in January, uh, after a few small assignments through temporary placement agencies, I was placed at a talent agency. It was like January 19th. And I was asked to work for an agent in the Hispanic marketing department. At that point in time, I was regretting that I took French in school, but I ended up working for someone who had faced adversity herself as a Latina woman. And she heard the story of 
how many interviews I went on and how much I was struggling to just get that first job. And she found a way to find an additional assistant who could answer the calls from the Spanish speaking clients and I could learn the administrative stuff that did not require speaking Spanish. And a few months later, once there was an opportunity in the entertainment marketing department, which did not require speaking Spanish, I was given that opportunity. But it took a total of seven months until I was hired on as a full-time employee. And then I was there for five years. Most assistants at a talent agency, as glamorous, of it, as glamorous as it may sound, are there about a year if they don't want to pursue a career as an agent. I also didn't have the opportunity to even consider exploring the possibilities of being an agent because the way that they had the training program set up in order to be an agent was not accessible. So I would have had to go from sitting on a desk, helping an agent out to the mailroom where I'd have to deliver packages around town, hit people's doorbells, even deliver Oscars or those things Again, it seems glamorous and cool hanging out with famous people, but especially with the Me Too movement, like I could have been risking my safety too. So there wasn't really an opportunity for me to move up or it wasn't verbalized that there was an alternative route I could take. So I just, I was hanging on tight to my job. In the entertainment marketing department, after about two and a half years, they started focusing on the creative side of things and were downsizing. So one of my bosses brought me to the music touring department, specifically like music marketing. But then once we got to that department, he said, I'm going to leave soon. So you need to figure out what you want to do, but you're safe. So I found out about this comedy club coverage group where any assistant at the talent agency could go out to comedy shows and write notes and send them to the agents. So I got really active in that. And it reminded me of that first internship where I would go out and write notes. And I was given the opportunity to, once there was an opening, to work for a comedy touring agent where we would book comedians around the country at different shows. So I did that for about two and a half years. And then finally, people started asking me what it was I was passionate about. I said, I'm passionate about changing what we see in the media because it affects how people like me are treated in society. And then I was able to talk to high level people within the talent agency and they gave me the platform in October of 2011 to host a panel discussion of actors with and without disabilities, having a conversation of, about the importance of authenticity and including people with disabilities in TV shows and movies, especially when the roles are described as people with disabilities. And from that, I built a Twitter and a Facebook just sharing stories because I think everyone wants to see someone like them. So the more stories we put out there about disability, hopefully the more others can relate to it. And this passion of mine also goes back to seeing people like my parents when I was first born, not knowing what that meant for my future because they had seen nothing but negative portrayals of dwarfism. So how do we prevent parents from second guessing taking their child home? We've got to figure out how do we influence the thing that influences people the most? So from that, I was offered a job to work at CBS television studios in the television casting department. And I was there for about a year, but they weren't ready for the change that I wanted to see. And then uh, my, one of my roommates, Pat, I actually met him. He was the one who convinced me to move out to California. He, unfortunately, he was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And I was kind of getting forced out of the job and I had to figure out, okay, what's next? Am I going to stay in California? Am I going to have to find a new roommate? Because he would have to move back to Georgia to be with his family. He knew that I just didn't have the capacity to be his full-time caretaker. And I went home. It was November, 2012. I went home and it took me about two months to decide, am I going to take all my stuff out of the apartment and officially move out of LA? It was not an easy decision. I mentioned... Uh, earlier on to just even with the mental health, I, I definitely hit a point of what's next in my career, but I just didn't view it the same way as obviously I viewed the last year of what I experienced. But it was tough because anytime LA would come up when I was back home in Boston, I would just be bawling because I just didn't know if I was going to be able to find my place there again. 
So I made the decision to move home. My sister is a teacher and she invited me to come meet her students because she has always talked about me. And I thought, instead of me just coming to meet your students, because I have this mindset of if I'm not working, I need to treat every day. I'm not working, looking for a job. How do I make this more productive? So she gave me the opportunity to come share my story with her students. And then I just started doing it more and more. I went to Rotary Clubs, went to all these different places. I thought that people didn't want to hear my story because I didn't reach a certain point in my career. But then I started to realize that I still have the ability to help people and make change. And when that realization really hit was when I went to a weekend meeting through the organization Little People of America. They have a national conference every year that's a week long, but then they have weekend meetings in the spring and fall in local areas to make it more um, economical friendly for people in the local areas who can't travel to a national convention. And they have a parents meeting at all of these. And a lot of the parents were talking about the issues that I always tried to avoid of being with my class and getting to know all the same people but there are families that can't control moving from one place to another because of a job or even big communities. Some child may come from a very small elementary school and then they go to a middle school and they're just meeting hundreds of other people who just don't know any better. So I've had the ability to go talk to the administrators at these schools where there's a need, let them know the accommodations I had growing up, not saying that that person wants the same things, but just giving them some ideas. And then speaking to the whole student body, the incoming student body, to allow them to ask me the hard questions without that student being put on the spot. So that started building up. And then after about a year of living at home, I was invited to go speak in Kenya to speak on behalf of the Little People organization that was forming there. So I spent a week there. And then I hit that year and a half mark of being at home and knew that I love speaking and I want to continue to do it, but it can't be the only thing that I do. So I was given the opportunity to move from Boston to the New York area to work in the diversity department at the Actors Union. And I was there for about three and a half years advocating for all of the underrepresented groups on film and TV and broadcast. But one of the challenges was a lot of the people who have time to dedicate to the Actors Union are not active in their careers because they have time to volunteer to be part of the union. So there were things that needed to be addressed that people weren't willing to address. I learned a lot. It was a good experience. I had a great boss. One of the biggest pieces of having the great boss that I did who recruited me for that role was that we found a great way to build a relationship of constructive feedback. There's a big fear when it comes to addressing the disability community and telling people that they're doing something wrong because you don't want to offend but it's important for me to get that constructive feedback in order to learn and grow. And I think that was one of the weaknesses when I went through all of those interviews, I was facing a lot of discrimination, but nobody was really telling me if I was terrible at interviewing. It's very possible I could have been terrible at interviewing. I was driving around Los Angeles in traffic to four interviews a day. I could have looked exhausted at every single one of those interviews but I'm under the assumption that nobody was thinking that because they didn't say it. So with this boss, we found a way where if I made a mistake, it wouldn't be like, you made a mistake, this is the end of the world, you're never gonna get better. It would be, let's talk about that mistake and let's talk about how to do better in the future. So it's always using that language of in the future, try doing it this way. So even if someone's hesitant about a, a, giving constructive feedback, I think it's important to just, offer up the question, can I give you some feedback and see how someone responds? Because that was something that was super helpful to me. So after the three and a half years at the Actors Union, I was invited to attend a conference in Orlando, Florida, and it was corporations coming together to talk about disability inclusion and the importance of advancing disability inclusion within their organizations. And it showed that people actually are passionate and want to make change. Where in the entertainment industry, when it comes to addressing decision makers, they aren't ready to admit that change needs to happen or that they have a relation to disability. It's kind of just thought of as an afterthought. So I was given the opportunity to 
work for the organization that put on the conference. I was volunteering. This was August of 2017. And then I was offered a job to work for them in September and started in November because I was very loyal, even though I was ready to leave the Actors Union. I was loyal and wanted to find the last day possible to give notice uh, just to make sure it was a proper exit. And I haven't looked back. It was an amazing opportunity for me to work with people who actually are willing and wanting to make change and going into these environments with Fortune 1000 companies, people who are representing those companies sit in high level positions and either identify as an ally or person with disability themselves or just someone who knows this work's important. And we've made a lot of traction over the past four or year, five years and there's still a long way to go. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up my presentation quick before we do questions and just show you just a little bit of etiquette around disability. So the organization that I work for is called Disability In, and we want to really strengthen the word disability. So for those of you who may not be aware, uh, disability, as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed in 1990, is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more late major life activities, having a history or record of such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. I don't love the word impairment, but that's how it's defined. 75% of disabilities are not apparent, meaning you can't see them. So examples of disability include physical mobility, blind, low vision, deaf, hearing loss, intellectual, developmental, speech difficulties, psychiatric mental illness, learning and attention issues, epilepsy, cancer, diabetes, post-traumatic stress, HIV AIDS, and chronic migraines. When it comes to language, I think a lot of people are afraid of addressing the disability community because they don't know what terms to use. I tell people just call me Becky and get to know me and then we can talk. But proper language, there's kind of a divide in the disability community just based on people's experiences and preferences. Some prefer people first, which is a person with a disability, a person who uses a wheelchair, and others may want identity first, disabled people or autistic woman. Improper language, so outdated language would be handicap retarded, so avoid using those terms. Even when it comes to parking options, I would say accessible parking. Disempowering language is suffering from or confined to. Ableist language, using childlike vocabulary, becoming insulting or condescending. The reality is I'm four feet tall. I'm an adult, but people may assume that they can talk to me like a child, which is not okay. Uh, and then euphemistic language, physically challenged or differently abled. I have a strong belief that we should stop dancing around the word disability and embrace it. And hopefully that can bring more people together and make people less fearful. When it comes to little people, because people, even within the little people community, not everyone identifies as having a disability unless maybe they have an additional disability like using a walker or a cane or a wheelchair or deaf, hard of hearing or blind, low vision in addition to their dwarfism. Uh, but I'm okay, and it is defined under the Americans with Disabilities Act, dwarfism would be included. Um, so dwarfism is a medical or genetic condition that usually results in an adult at height 4'10 or shorter among both men and women, although in some cases a person with a dwarven condition may be slightly taller than that. So the most preferred term is our name. Like I said, just call me Becky. But you can also use the terms little person, LP, person, or individual with dwarfism, dwarf or short statured. An improper term would be midget. It's an outdated, antiquated term that is considered offensive and degrading to the little people community. So I would avoid using that term. If you hear someone who is okay with that term, it may be that they had a negative experience growing up and they're totally okay because they like when people make fun of them. So I would get multiple opinions because a majority of the little people community does not want to hear that word. So just quickly, some common courtesies when working with people with disabilities. When setting up an interview or planning an event, ask if participants need an accommodation. Most accommodations cost less than $500 and they're gonna help a lot more people than you think. What we found is that a lot of people who ask for accommodations don't necessarily identify as having a disability, but giving someone the option can allow them to bring their whole selves to work. 
Make sure you assess the physical location for accessibility during in-person events. Um, I know we've kind of gotten to a virtual world and we've started to realize that more people with disabilities can be successful working from home, but there will still be people with disabilities who want to come to the office and they should be given that option. For virtual events, you wanna make sure the meeting platform is accessible. Set the accessibility expectations and reminders at the start of the meeting. Describe all visual, visual content. So I could say that on the right side of the slide, there's a photo of me speaking to two people on a yellow couch. Don't interrupt. Captioners can only caption one person at a time. Share the materials in advance. So if I share this, these materials in advance on this photo, there would be some alternative text that I created describing the photo. So they would be able to examine it in advance. Schedule breaks for anything over an hour and encourage stretch breaks as needed. So if you're booking an interpreter for an event, if the event is over an hour, you would need two interpreters. And then for communication, greet persons with disabilities the same as you would greet those without. And it's okay to use common expressions like break a leg or see you later. People will be okay with it. And then just a few takeaways. I know Megan always talked about the importance of takeaways. Think about how you engage pe with people with disabilities. Think about how you're engaging with all people. It shouldn't take different strategies. It should be similar. And let's choose to reach out and do better together. Don't feel bad about any mistakes you've made in the past. The purpose of this presentation is to help you do better in the future. And there's a great resource guide I serve on the board of the Arizona State National Center on Disability and Journalism. And it goes into every type of disability and the preferred terms and those terms that you should avoid when it comes to addressing each disability. Even though it's originally created for journalists, it can help everyday people with their interaction and understanding. You can lean on disability inclusion consultants. You don't have to do this work alone. There's a lot of companies already doing this work and engage in this work, no matter what your role is, because it's important. Microsoft, Satya Nadella, CEO, has two children, one unfortunately passed recently, but have significant disabilities. He's not afraid to talk about it. So it's not just that disability sits in DNI or HR, it sits across the organization. There's an employee resource group for disability within the marketing department. There are other ways to integrate disability throughout the organization. And especially today in the world that we're in, just be kind. So I know I promised to be short and I went, <laughs> but I'd love to answer questions that people have. Thank you so much, Becky. No, I think all of it was really great. And I, I love the presentation. There has been some questions. Can we share this presentation? Are you okay with that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So I'll send um, this out to folks at the conclusion. Um, I actually just have two two questions and I should probably know one of them, but I don't. Um, so my husband is hearing impaired. And so we've always said, you know, when I call the doctors or do anything, I always preface like I'm calling because my husband is hearing impaired. And he has made comments like it's pro we probably shouldn't use that word anymore but it's just it's in our vocabulary right now why why and I guess I should have asked him but I didn't uh 